In the complex tapestry of human experiences, the challenges faced by individuals who identify as gay are multifaceted and extend beyond the boundaries of the outside world. This is particularly evident within the confined spaces of a prison, where the struggles of being gay intersect with the harsh realities of incarceration. In this exploration, we will dive into what happens to gay inmates in prison, highlighting how they face difficulties rooted in societal prejudices that are not confined to the external world but persist within the walls of prison as well. Brutally assaulted. The case of Kenneth J. Houck Jr., an openly gay federal inmate who endured a brutal assault while detained in Philadelphia, sheds light on the challenges faced by individuals within the prison system, particularly those who identify as LGBTQ+. Houck's journey through the federal prison system was marked by a turbulent six years, culminating in a violent attack on November 10, 2011, at the Federal Detention Center in Philadelphia. Two inmates entered his cell, subjected him to physical assault, and left him with a fractured right leg, necessitating the installation of a metal rod for stabilization. Disturbingly, Hauk had reportedly requested increased security prior to the assault due to homophobic threats from fellow inmates, but his pleas were allegedly denied by prison authorities. The assault on Hauk, who was awaiting sentencing after pleading guilty to transporting child pornography, took a toll on both his physical and emotional well-being. Despite of the severity of the attack and his claims that it was motivated by anti-LGBT animus, the assailants were not charged with committing hate crimes, Hook's calls for hate crime charges went unanswered, underscoring the challenges faced by LGBTQ plus inmates seeking protection and justice within the prison system. Hook's own criminal actions, involving the downloading and sharing of child pornography, add a layer of complexity to the narrative. Expressing remorse for his crimes, he acknowledged the harm caused by the child porn industry and highlighted the impact of his actions on the victims involved. The aftermath of the assault revealed additional issues within the prison system, as Hauk alleged inadequate medical care, discrimination in employment opportunities, and restricted access to LGBT-related reading materials. His subsequent legal actions, including a lawsuit against the Federal Bureau of Prisons for damages exceeding $1 million, illustrate the ongoing struggles faced by inmates seeking accountability and justice for mistreatment within the prison system. Despite these challenges, Duke's release to a halfway house in New York, specifically the Syracuse Pavilion, suggests a step towards reintegration into society. Society. However, the requirement for him to register as a sex offender for the rest of his life underscores the lasting consequences of his criminal actions. Sexual Abuse by Correctional Officer in a shocking revelation, a federal civil rights lawsuit filed in October 2021 unveils distressing allegations of a correctional officer drugging and sexually assaulting a 31-year-old gay inmate at the Northern State Prison in Newark, New Jersey. The victim, identified as John Doe in the lawsuit, claims that the officer coerced him into taking a pill and then instructed him to perform oral sex, all within the confines of the prison. According to the lawsuit, the victim, incarcerated for three years on a drug-related charge and 34 months sober at the time, was allegedly approached by the correctional officer while waiting in the medication-assisted treatment line for opioid addiction. The officer reportedly lured him into an area near the bathroom, strategically off-camera, and compelled him to ingest a pill before instructing him to perform a sexual act. Upon reporting the assault, the victim faced immediate challenges. The lawsuit alleges that he was pressured into recanting his story and wrongly punished for having drugs in his system, later identified as methamphetamines. Moreover, the victim claims he was subjected to to a subsequent assault by a group of correctional officers and placed in isolation for six months as retaliation for reporting the sexual assault. The Department of Corrections eventually relied on the victim's testimony to terminate the accused officer. However, the officer is currently appealing his termination and the lawsuit implies a lack of support from the union representing correctional officers. The legal action underscores a broader issue within the DR, pointing to a history of both sexual and physical abuse by prison staff, with a particular focus on a women's prison where federal authorities found a pervasive culture of sexual abuse. The victim, who has since been released from prison, continues to grapple with the psychological aftermath of the alleged assault, seeking compensatory and punitive damages against the Diak administration and the implicated officers. The lawsuit highlights the lasting impact on the victim's mental health, necessitating ongoing psychological treatment, including counseling and medication. This case not only exposes the vulnerability of gay inmates within the prison system, but also raises broader concerns about the safety and well-being of all incarcerated individuals. Attack by other inmates 
In a distressing incident at the St. John's Youth Academy in Florida, a 16-year-old inmate who recently came out as gay became the victim of a targeted attack by fellow inmates. Devin Jackson, 18, and an unidentified 14-year-old have been charged in connection with the assault, shedding light on the vulnerability faced by LGBTQ plus youth within the juvenile justice system. According to reports from the St. John's County Sheriff's Office, the assault took place in the B pod of the facility, where the victim, who recently opened up about his sexual orientation, orientation was confronted by Jackson. The attacker, allegedly motivated by the victim's disclosure, approached him from behind and launched a physical assault, citing a homophobic slur during the attack. The incident appears to have been incited by the passing of a book containing derogatory notes about the victim's sexual orientation to another inmate. The victim, now subjected to physical harm, reported the attack to authorities, highlighting the pervasive risks faced by LGBTQ plus youth within juvenile correctional facilities. Surveillance footage captured part of the assault, providing evidence for the charges against Jackson. As he was being apprehended, Jackson claimed that he attacked the victim because he overheard a request for sexual favors. Jackson faces a first-degree felony battery charge, and authorities are considering elevating it to a hate crime pending review by the state attorney's office. Charges against the 14-year-old accomplice are also under consideration. Cindy Watson, CEO of Jasmine, an organization supporting LGBTQ plus teens, emphasized that a significant percentage percentage of juvenile prisoners identify as gay. Many, however, fear for their safety and refrain from coming out due to the heightened risk of bullying and harassment within such facilities. The incident at St. John's Youth Academy underscores the urgent need for comprehensive measures to ensure the safety and well-being of LGBTQ plus individuals within the juvenile justice system. The Florida Juvenile Justice Department expressed zero tolerance for harassment and discrimination, emphasizing its commitment to maintaining a safe environment environment for all youth in custody. Harassment followed by a biting incident. In a harrowing incident at Warren County Regional Jail in Kentucky, Brandon Millam, a 26-year-old gay man, is filing a lawsuit against the jail and a fellow inmate, Timothy Schwartz. Millam alleges that Schwartz physically assaulted him, resulting in the biting off of part of his nose after enduring days of harassment and threats based on his sexual orientation. On July 2nd, Brandon Millam was sitting on his bed when Timothy Schwartz approached him, pinned him against the wall, and began punching his face. The assault reached a horrifying climax as Milam claims he he heard a crunching sound when Schwartz bit off a portion of his nose and spat it onto the floor. The attack left Milam disfigured, without a sense of smell and in ongoing physical pain. Milam's lawsuit contends that Schwartz, along with other inmates, had subjected him to gay slurs and threats for about a week leading up to the violent incident. The suite highlights the distressing environment within the jail, where Milam and Schwartz were placed in a single cell with approximately 14 other men. Following the attack, doctors attempted to reattach the severed piece of Milam's nose but their efforts proved unsuccessful. Now facing extensive reconstructive surgeries estimated to cost $26,000, Milam grapples with the aftermath of the brutal assault, both physically and emotionally. Milam's attorneys, including Miss Dawson Mayer, have characterized the attack as an outrageously violent act and expressed concern about the lack of protection in what is supposed to be a secure environment. The Kentucky Equality Federation, assisting Milam in his suit, is urging federal authorities to consider the case as a hate crime, emphasizing the jail's alleged deliberate indifference towards Milam's safety. The Kentucky Equality Federation points to a growing trend of harassment against gay inmates within the state's law enforcement. The advocacy group believes that the jail's apparent disregard for Milam's safety, given his sexual orientation, holds them liable for civil damages. Schwartz, indicted on an assault charge, has pleaded not guilty and remains in jail for an alleged scheme unrelated to the assault. Milam, initially jailed for violating probation related to a guilty plea for felony, theft has since been placed on house arrest. Facing hate crimes. In a disturbing incident at Orleans Parish Prison, inmate John L. Logan, 36, stands accused of committing a hate crime in an attack targeting a 23-year-old gay inmate within the temporary tent facilities of the lockup. The assault, which occurred on July 25th, highlights the challenges faced by LGBTQ plus individuals in correctional facilities and raises concerns about ongoing violence within OPP. According to an arrest report, John L. Logan, known as Pharaoh in the jail, allegedly punched the gay inmate 
made in the nose in a targeted attack. The victim reported that Logan had previously subjected him and his boyfriend to derogatory names, indicating a pattern of discrimination against his sexual orientation. The assault took place while the victim was playing cards with his boyfriend, and other inmates joined in the attack, causing injuries to the victim's face and right hand. Following an investigation by Sheriff Marlon Guzman's Investigative Services Bureau, John L. Logan was rebooked on felony charges of hate crime and second-degree battery. The incident underscores the need for heightened awareness and protection of LGBTQ plus individuals within the prison system. This attack adds to the ongoing concerns about violence within OPP, with inmate advocates and federal overseers of court-ordered reforms expressing alarm over the persistence of inmate-on-inmate -inmate attacks. A team of experts overseeing the reforms testified that violence remains at an alarming rate, prompting recommendations for inmate transfers to other parishes if a new jail facility is not operational by the scheduled date. The assault on the gay inmate further emphasizes the urgency of implementing comprehensive reforms within OPP. Recent testimonies from experts overseeing the reforms described the current conditions as having an unacceptable level of violence for human beings to be in. The call for improved safety measures and adherence to court-ordered reforms aims to address the systemic issues contributing to violence within the correctional facility. Inmate Threat Forced Same Cell a harrowing incident at a federal prison has brought to light the severe consequences faced by LGBTQ plus inmates. Alec Arapaho, a gay Native American inmate, filed a civil rights complaint against 29 prison officials, alleging that he was subjected to threats, harassment, and a brutal assault after authorities failed to address the I, dangers he faced adequately. The federal government has agreed to settle the civil rights claim for a maximum penalty of $750,000. Arapaho, initially incarcerated at FCI Florence tried to conceal his sexual orientation to avoid harassment. However, he became a target of threats and harassment by another inmate, William Mexican, who demanded money and made explicit threats. Arapaho reported the threats to prison officials through his stepmother, leading to an investigation. The prison officials investigated Arapaho's claims but found no verifiable threat to his safety. Despite these threats, Arapaho was later transferred to a segregated housing unit at USP Florence, a high security facility on the same property. However, the threats persisted as other Native American inmates voted him off the yard, demonstrating the ongoing danger he faced. In a shocking turn of events, prison officials transferred Mexicans into Arapaho's cell without proper investigation or consideration of safety risks. Left alone and unsupervised for over two days, Mexican carried out a brutal assault, including multiple rapes and physical abuse against Arapaho. Arapaho's attempts to seek help through duress buttons and security cameras proved futile. Arapaho filed a civil rights complaint against 29 prison officials, mainly guards, for their failure to protect him. The federal government has agreed to settle the claim for a maximum penalty of $750,000. Arapaho's lawyer, David Lane, emphasizes the need for criminal charges against guards who lied during investigations, citing it as a crime. An investigation by the Special Investigative Agents Office at the Federal Bureau of Prisons, BOP, found that 28 guards committed departmental offenses, including inattention to duty and falsifying documents. The Bureau of Prisons declined to comment on disciplinary actions, citing pending litigation, but acknowledged its commitment to ensuring inmate safety. Alec Arapaho's traumatic experience sheds light on the vulnerabilities faced by LGBTQ plus inmates in correctional facilities. The case highlights the critical need for improved safeguards, thorough investigations, and accountability within the prison system to protect inmates from discrimination, threats, and violence based on their sexual orientation beaten as a rite of passage. In a shocking case highlighting the deep-rooted issues within the prison system, two members of the notorious white supremacist gang, Aryan Circle, have been sentenced to prison for the brutal beating of an inmate suspected to be gay. The incident, which occurred in Yazoo City, Mississippi, sheds light on the challenges faced by LGBTQ plus inmates in the prison environment. William Glenn Chun, a high-ranking leader in the Aryan Circle gang, also known as Big Head, ordered Matthew Renfro, alias Mongo, to assault an inmate as a rite of passage within the gang. The victim was chosen based on Chun's belief that he was homosexual, making him a target for the gang's violent initiation rituals. On January 25, 2023, both Chun and Renfro were sentenced to 10 years in prison for their involvement in the attempted murder of the inmate. The severity of the charges underscores the gravity of the crime committed within the prison walls. The Aryan Circle is identified as one of the largest white supremacist prison gangs in the United States, with a significant presence in Texas. According to the Anti-Defamation League, 
League. The gang enforces its rules through threats, intimidation, and acts of violence, promoting discipline among its members. This incident adds to the gang's history of promoting violence and hate within the prison system. Rentfrau, aspiring to gain full membership in the Aryan Circle, subjected the victim to a brutal assault on August 17, 2017. The initiation involved beating and stabbing the inmate as directed by Chun. The victim suffered severe injuries, including a collapsed lung, rib fractures, chest puncture wounds, and cuts on his face and head. Chun's attorney, Scott Gilbert, attributed some blame to the prison guards, alleging that they placed the victim in a housing unit where he was at risk due to his sexual orientation. Gilbert claimed that the guards failed to notice two separate attacks on the victim and delayed providing medical care after the assault. Chun and Rentfrau were convicted of violent crime in aid of racketeering attempted murder in a trial held in the Southern District of Mississippi in October. The sentencing reflects the justice system's commitment to holding individuals accountable for their actions, even within the challenging prison environment. Beaten to death by cellmate. The Broward County Jail is under scrutiny after the tragic death of 29-year-old Janard Geffrard, who was brutally beaten to death by his cellmate Kevin Barnes. The incident has raised questions about the safety and well-being of inmates, especially those I belonging to vulnerable communities within the prison system. On December 16, 2023, Janard Geffrard fell victim to a violent attack by his cellmate Kevin Barnes, who later confessed to the assault. Barnes revealed to deputies that he targeted Geffrard because of his sexual orientation and alleged hygiene issues. The confession outlined the severity of the beating, resulting in Geffrard suffering a fractured sternum, broken ribs, and bruised lungs. Janard Geffrard's mother, Marcia Irving, is demanding a thorough investigation into the circumstances surrounding her son's death. She expressed her distress, questioning how the guards allowed such a violent incident to occur within the Broward County Jail. The family's attorney, Josiah Graham, highlighted the brutal nature of the attack and the delay in notifying Geffrard's family about the incident. Surveillance footage revealed the brutal beating that took place inside the cell, lasting over 20 minutes before Broward Sheriff's Office deputies responded. Unfortunately, by the time Geffrard was taken to the hospital an hour after the attack, he had already succumbed to his injuries. This raises concerns about the correctional facility's timely intervention and emergency response procedures. Geffrard, who was awaiting transfer due to being declared incompetent to stand trial, was in jail for six months on a burglary charge. The incident underscores concerns about mental health care for inmates, prompting Broward County Public Defender Gordon Weeks to address the issue in a letter to the sheriff. Weeks expressed worry about a pattern of neglect and indifference towards inmates with mental health issues. The Broward Sheriff's Office has initiated an internal affairs investigation into the incident. Two BSO employees, a detention deputy and a detention technician, have been placed on administrative investigative leave with pay. Sheriff Gregory Tony, in a letter last year, had already expressed concerns about mental health care for inmates at the county jail. The tragic death death of Janard Jeffrard sheds light on the challenges faced by LGBTQ plus inmates within the prison system and raises broader issues related to mental health care and correctional facilities. As the investigation unfolds, there is a growing call for reforms to ensure the safety and well-being of all inmates, regardless of their sexual orientation or mental health status. Repeatedly raped and beaten, a 21-year-old gay inmate in Florence, Colorado, has filed a federal lawsuit alleging he was subjected to repeated rape and physical assault after being placed in a cell with a man who had previously threatened him. The victim, whose identity is currently withheld, is seeking compensatory damages for the severe physical and emotional trauma endured during the harrowing incidents. The inmate claimed that he informed several correctional officials, including two lieutenants, about threats from eight members of an American Indian prison gang known as the Boys. The gang members accused the victim of being gay and allegedly voted him off the yard, indicating that he would be targeted for attack if he did not go into segregation. Denver attorney David Lane, who filed the lawsuit against the U.S. Federal Bureau of Prisons, characterized the situation as an intentional setup, describing it as malice and sadistic. The lawsuit contends that prison officials ignored the inmate's pleas for protection, leading to the subsequent brutal attacks. The inmate made an emotional plea to prison officials, expressing that his life was in danger and requesting protective custody. However, one official reportedly smiled at the request, and another allegedly looked into the threats by consulting gang members, according to the lawsuit. Despite the inmate's pleas and the admission from gang member William Mexican that threats were made, the victim was eventually placed in the same cell as Mexican. Mexican, openly taunting the victim, asked, are you nervous? In the presence of correctional officers. The victim, fearing for his safety, had explicitly voiced his concerns, but officials seemingly disregarded them. Over the next three days, 
the inmate faced continuous beatings and sexual assaults by Mexican. Shockingly, the victim's attempts to seek help by pushing the alarm button were allegedly ignored. Mexican later admitted to assaulting the victim to avoid fellow inmates thinking he condoned homosexuality. William Mexican was indicted in federal court on charges of sexual abuse by force or violence and assault, resulting in serious injury. The victim, through the lawsuit, holds the prison officials accountable for negligence and complicity in the horrific incidents that unfolded. Facing negligence and harrowing experience, a prison psychologist at the California Medical Facility in Vacaville, Lori Jesperson, has filed a lawsuit against the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation claiming she faced retaliation and harassment for reporting mistreatment and discrimination against LGBTQ inmates. Jesperson, who is openly lesbian, alleges egregious incidents, including being locked in a room twice with a dangerous inmate and facing demotion in retaliation for her advocacy. Jesperson began reporting instances of discrimination against gay and trans transgender inmates in 2014, asserting that her concerns were either ignored or met with retaliation. The lawsuit accuses the CDCR of violating civil rights, whistleblower protection laws, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, and the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. She claims that a fellow corrections officer subjected her to harassment, suggesting inmate attacks and fostering a hostile work environment. Furthermore, workers at the facility allegedly exposed a transgender inmate on social media, degrading them with derogatory terms. In a disturbing incident, Jesperson reported an assault against a gay inmate under the Prison Rape Elimination Act, accusing a worker of negligence for failing to secure a shower door, resulting in a subsequent attack. The most severe allegations involve Jesperson being intentionally locked in a unit with a life sentence devoid of supervision or alarm access, occurring on two occasions in December 2015 and March 2016. These troubling accusations paint a grim picture of negligence, discrimination, and retaliation within the CDCR. Jesperson contends that she was demoted to an administrative position in retaliation for her reports. Following a medical leave in early 2016, she returned to a desk job with primarily administrative tasks, impacting her professional standing. The lawsuit seeks damages for Jesperson restoration to her former position as a clinical psychologist, a permanent injunction against unlawful behavior by the CDCR, and the implementation of programs to address the hostile work environment. Lori Jesperson's case underscores the challenges faced by advocates for LGBTQ inmates within the prison system and highlights the urgency for institutional reforms to ensure the safety and fair treatment of vulnerable populations. The lawsuit seeks accountability and redress for the alleged negligence and mistreatment, emphasizing the need for systemic systemic changes within the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, victims of anti-gay purge, the harrowing account of Adam, a gay man who endured torture during the anti-gay purge in Chechnya, paints a disturbing picture of the extreme persecution faced by the LGBTQ plus community in the region. Adam's ordeal began when he received a call from a seemingly trusted gay friend proposing a meeting. However, upon arrival, he realized it was a setup as uniformed men confronted him, accusing him of being gay. Adam was then forcibly taken to an informal detention facility where he, along with more than a dozen other gay men, became victims of systematic torture. His captors subjected him to daily electric shocks by attaching metal clamps to his fingers and toes connected to a machine. The abuse escalated if Adam managed to endure the shocks without screaming, with others joining in to beat him with wooden sticks or metal rods. Throughout the torture sessions, verbal abuse was hurled at him solely based on his sexual orientation. The tormentors demanded information about other gay men in Chechnya, creating an atmosphere of fear and betrayal. The Guardian reports that similar mop-up campaigns were orchestrated by governmental security forces in various towns across the region, indicating a coordinated effort to eradicate the LGBTQ plus community. Igor Kochetkov, a gay rights activist from St. Petersburg, described the situation as the mass persecution of gay people, reaching unprecedented levels not only in Russia but in recent world history. The allegations include not only physical torture but also kidnappings by authorities, further highlighting the gravity of the crimes. Adam's testimony, supported by another gay Chechen man, adds credibility to reports of a large-scale anti-gay campaign in Chechnya involving hundreds of men. The extreme conservatism and homophobia in Chechen society, compounded by the silence and shame surrounding LGBTQ plus issues, create an environment conducive to such atrocities. The Guardian notes that Chechen leader Ramzan Kadyrov, backed by Moscow, has faced accusations of human rights abuses. However, the Kremlin turns a blind eye to these violations in exchange for Kadyrov's loyalty to Vladimir Putin. While Chechen 
officials, including Katerov's spokesman Alvi Karimov, dismiss these reports as lies and disinformation. Human rights activists and journalists argue that the evidence, including testimonies and photographs of torture-inflicted wounds, points to a grave humanitarian crisis. Adam fearing for his life, managed to escape Chechnya, but he, like many others, lives in constant fear, unable to contact his family due to monitoring. The international community, including European embassies, is urged to take action and provide asylum for gay Chechens fleeing persecution. The urgency of the situation is emphasized by the fact that lives are at stake, with reports suggesting that some gay men may have already lost their lives in this brutal anti-gay purge. Despite progress in 2024, acceptance of gays remains an ongoing challenge, evident in instances of torture, hate crimes, and violence within prison walls. This was all from our side. Thank you for staying with us. If you enjoy our content, our newest videos are just a click away.